it's become a staple of these kinds of conferences to unveil a new kind of technology, so different, so shocking that it can elicit a wow. At the same time, we live in an age of miracles, and there seems to be a new wow announcement almost every day. So the question is, can anything still amaze us? And I'm thinking of the kind of amazement uh, I used to feel when I'd see on the cover of uh, Mechanics Illustrated or um, science magazines, you know, the perfect little city of the future resting peacefully under a dome or uh, my personal favorite, uh, gyrocopters, gyrocopters in every garage. Um, they haven't come about yet, uh, but I thought that in this grouping of speakers, I would uh, offer you some uh, ideas that range from fairly far out, not yet, we don't think in the immediate future, all the way to magic that you can access today and take home with you. So, we're going to begin with uh, Dr. Brendan Quine. Uh, he runs a small company from an unlikely place, uh, but has some very big dreams for a space elevator. Dr. Quine. Thank you. Well, uh, hi everyone. Um, I'm um, Brendan Quine. I'm the Chief uh, Technical Officer of uh, Thoth Technology, uh, Inc. I'm also a professor at York University in York's uh, new Lausanne School of Engineering. Um, I'm pleased to have our President and Chief, uh, uh, Chief uh, Executive Officer with me uh, today, Dr. Caroline Roberts, uh, in the audience. So I'm going to talk to you about one of those projects which um, maybe it's far out or maybe it's closer than you think. Um, uh, the space elevator. Um, but um, before I do that, um, and since we haven't hired uh, Zuma Media yet, um, uh, to, some of you may not have uh, heard of us, and so I'm just going to give you a couple of slides to give you a flavor of uh, what Thoth does. Um, so uh, one of the uh, um, activities that uh, we're involved in is we run the Algonquin Radio Observatory. So um, a little known fact is that in the middle of Algonquin Park, um, there is the largest radio antenna in Canada, and one of the largest antennas in the world. Uh, it's about 46 meters across, uh, and the antenna weighs around one and a half thousand tons. Uh, and Thoth Technology um, has assumed operations of the antenna since 2007, uh, completely refurbed it uh, back to operational status, and we now use it um, uh, for space surveillance uh, and uh, to support astronomy, uh, in particular observing pulsars and fast radio bursts. Um, Thoth was originally founded about 15 years ago, uh, and we're headquartered uh, at the observatory. Thoth also operates a space uh, qualification division uh, where we take third-party space equipment made by Canada's large space companies and we certify it for space flight. Um, uh, we do that in this vacuum chamber here. Uh, essentially, we simulate uh, a hard vacuum environment and the thermal environment of space flight. And if your system survives this, uh, then you're probably good to go in space. And if you don't survive, then you're not. <laughs> um, Thoth's also interested in um, uh, other transformative technologies, uh, and one in particular I wanted to highlight is our uh, range of micro-instrumentation uh, called Argus and Aurora, and these are infrared cameras um, that allow you uh, to observe the atmosphere from space. We look straight down on the atmosphere, and in the infrared there are distinct fingerprint-like uh, patterns uh, which are associated with molecules like carbon dioxide. Uh, and through a little bit of uh, clever mathematics, it's possible to take a spectrum that we record in space, I'm showing one on the top right, uh, and then invert that model to predict how much carbon dioxide was uh, below the spacecraft on a grid spacing of about 1.5 kilometers. Um, so many of you are, are familiar with the new uh, protocols uh, that are being developed, and essentially uh, what's going to happen is the taxation basis will come down on a country-by-country -country basis uh, uh, to support the new green economy, and so it's extremely important that we have our own means to observe things like pollutants like carbon dioxide, or uh, it's likely we're going to pay more tax. 
Um, and then lastly, um, uh, we're also um, uh, interested in our own uh, uh, space exploration technologies. Uh, and for some time now, we've been uh, developing indigenously in Canada all the components and the technologies required to send a small robotic lander uh, to the surface of Mars. Um, and uh, in fact, this project provides one of the sort of umbrellas of the technology developments uh, that Thoth undertakes. But we're not here to talk about that today. Um, we're here to talk about space elevators. Um, and so I'm going to start off uh, with a little bit about rocketry. Um, so uh, uh, we may as well start off with the biggest of the big. And uh, so this is a, a, a Saturn V. Oops. I wonder if I can play the video. Um, I'm not sure I can play it. Um, so this is a, a, a launch of a Saturn V. Saturn V was an incredible invention. Uh, this rocket would lift 210 tons into low Earth orbit. Okay, so we're placing, uh, with this rocket, a tower block into low Earth orbit. Um, the problem uh, with the Saturn V and with other rocketry uh, approaches is that they're extremely inefficient uh, in terms of their energy usage. Um, so just to give you a sense of uh, this uh, inefficiency, imagine that you have a rocket, and it's entirely uh, comprised of fuel. Um, and um, say it weighs 10 kilograms. Um, so now in rocketry, um, if you go to a, a, do a space engineering course at York University, you'll discover that we have a unit called ISP, uh, which measures the performance of rockets in seconds. Um, and it's basically equivalent to the exhaust velocity of the gas coming out the back of the rocket. So rocketry is a little bit like standing on a skateboard and throwing as hard as you can t-shirts off the back. Um, so and that's going to propel you forwards. But as you can imagine, that's not going to propel you forwards very fast unless you throw the t-shirts extremely hard. Um, and so um, just to give you a sense of the inefficiency of, of, uh, of this uh, technique, if I take this rocket, it's made of entirely of fuel, um, it's going to basically um, hover for about 3,000 seconds before it runs completely out of fuel. Um, and only approximately, in a typical rocket flight, only approximately 2% of the energy that's released in this massive chemical burn goes into the payload in terms of the energy needed to place it into orbit. And the rest um, is dissipated against the atmosphere. And this is a huge waste, uh, because the Saturn V rocket I just showed you had a significant fraction of the energy on board uh, of a small atomic weapon. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about space to just give you a sense of, uh, of where we're coming from here. Um, so space is like always falling. I'm going to dis uh, distinguish here between space as in going above 100 kilometers, which is one of the popular definitions, and space as going into orbit. So all the spacecraft that are providing you services, uh, uh, television, internet, are in uh, orbit, uh, somewhere in Earth's orbit. It begins around 200 kilometers above the Earth. Um, but it's not the potential energy that is the cost to get to space. It is the kinetic energy in the velocity of the spacecraft that you have to achieve. Um, and so um, just to give you a sense of that, if I want to put one kilogram into low Earth orbit, I need to supply about one megajoule of energy uh, to put it up to 100 kilometers. And then I need to supply 27 megajoules of energy in order to give it a tangential velocity. So basically what's happening here on the top left, the spacecraft is always falling towards the center of the Earth. The force vector acts towards the center of uh, gravity. But because it's moving so quickly, it continuously misses. And so if we get that velocity right and the altitude right, we can sustain an orbit. And the spacecraft will essentially, except for things like air drag, stay in orbit and rotate around the Earth uh, forevermore. Um, but to get this energy, this is a colossal amount of energy. So if I want to launch a personal spacecraft, let's say now it weighs about 10 tons. I want um, you know, air conditioning, and I don't want to just wear a spacesuit all the time. Um, so um, uh, that spacecraft's going to require about the output of our largest nuclear power generation uh, plant, uh, Pickering. And you're going to have to have that on board in order to be able to provide this energy electrically using rocketry. Um, so probably this is not a technology that is going to come to us anytime soon. Maybe, maybe it's going to be decades out before we can take an entire nuclear power station and collapse it into a, a core that may be only one ton. Um, so we need another method. 
Um, another way to think about orbit is if I know my velocity, I can reduce gravity to an effective gravity on the spacecraft. Um, and so it turns out to sustain low Earth orbit, I need to be traveling around 7,000 meters per second. Uh, and then uh, that will reduce my gravity to around um, 2 uh, from around 9.8. And if I get to around eight or nine um, um, uh, thousand meters per second, uh, then my gravity is essentially down to uh, zero, uh, and uh, I continually rotate around the Earth. So I want you to think of space now as, as basically you're falling, but you're moving, so you don't hit the Earth. Um, so. Um, we started thinking about how uh, we could uh, avoid this uh, uh, bill and really bring uh, the advantage of the space environment uh, to, uh, to uh, humanity in a much more cost-effective, much more environmentally effective method. Um, and uh, we started thinking about things that we could build up from the ground uh, rather than from, from space downwards. And we also started to think about how we would support the colossal mass uh, that we might need if we wanted to put um, a tower up to space. Uh, and we hit across the idea of using an inflatable tower. Um, now, like all good ideas, other people have ha had similar ideas um, uh, in the past. Uh, and I just want to highlight um, uh, Arthur C. Clarke really came and uh, popularized the idea of the space elevator uh, first in 1978 uh, with his books, The Fountains of Paradise. Um, but in terms of this inflatable concept, really the closest uh, uh, that we found is uh, David uh, Brin's novel, uh, Sundiver, published in 1979, uh, where um, two elevators are constructed along a very similar basis to the ones uh, that we're going to uh, describe. Um, so this is an image of our tower. So we're envisaging a tower which is 20 kilometers tall. Um, it's around 300 meters at the base, and it's pressurized to around 100 atmospheres, around 100 times the atmospheric strength. On top, uh, we have a payload uh, a, a bay. Uh, we have a, a flight deck uh, where we can launch into space. Um, we can um, uh, have hotels and restaurants. And now, rather than taking an extremely risky uh, and expensive rocket flight, to give you a sense, uh, if you want a two-week vacation on the International Space Station, the current ticket price is around $90 million. Um, so um, uh, by using electrical means to ascend, and also by using frictional contact with the tower, we no longer have to throw mass off the back in order to propel ourselves upwards. And this increases the efficiency from around 2%, um, uh, maybe up to around 90%. Uh, with regenerative braking systems. Uh, so the elevators would ascend up the side of the tower at about 12 kilometers an hour. It'll take you about an hour uh, to get to the top of the tower, uh, where you will still have gravity. That's a good thing, because space uh, zero G makes people very sick. Typically, um, you'll still uh, you'll be able to you'll have a light spring in your step because gravity will be slightly reduced, not by much. Um, but you'll be able to essentially enjoy uh, the vista, the scenery uh, that the astronauts get uh, from the International Space Station. And we think the ticket price would be around a thousand dollars a person. Um, so in thinking about this, um, uh, we started to uh, publish, uh, on my academic side, I started to publish uh, research papers uh, on uh, how we, we might actually implement this uh, approach. Um, and another cornerstone for us is not to use any technologies that don't exist today. Um, so our tower is made of uh, Kevlar and polyethylene. You can also, if you like metal, you could make it out of boron. Uh, boron has enough strength. Um, it's about the same weight as a super tanker uh, that moves oil around um, the uh, oceans today. Um, and the, the uh, next um, uh, trick that we had to come up with is how on earth do you stabilize something that tall? Okay, so we can't have cables, they're too heavy. Okay, too heavy, they're going to be difficult to sustain the stress. Um, and so we came up with this idea of an active tower. Um, that we would actually lean towards the wind force um, if a hurricane was incident on the tower. Um, and we would also be able to take out other vibration modes uh, in it. Um, and in thinking about this, um, uh, we realized that we came up with a unique control concept, uh, and we filed uh, patents in the United Kingdom, United States, and in Canada uh, on a control method. Um, simultaneously, we started building uh, models um, of it. Um, I'm showing on the bottom right-hand side uh, a model uh, which stands three stories high, uh, and it's in a Petrie Science and Engineering Building at York University. Um, it's pressurized to around uh, seven pounds per square inch, and it weighs 15 kilos. 
Um, so that gives you a sense of the technology. Uh, we built this demonstrator just to be able to test out the control uh, technologies uh, on the tower. Um, so our design constraint was a survival of a Category 5 hurricane with winds sustaining up to 250 kilometers an hour over more than four, meters of the, four kilometers of the length of the tower. Uh, and uh, after you do all the maths, it turns out you would have to lean the tower about one degree into the wind in order to use the colossal weight of the tower against the forces uh, acting on the tower. So, uh, by comparison, um, uh, so we're not getting into space here, we're just getting 20 kilometers above the ground, and we haven't solved this kinetic energy issue. Um, we've solved part of the, the uh, potential energy issue, um, but there is a huge advantage. And the huge advantage is now, instead of launching vertically, we can launch horizontally directly towards the orbit that we want. And that will save around 30% of the fuel cost of going into low Earth orbit. So um, it doesn't sound like a lot, but the advantage of that saving is that you now do not require multi-stage rocketry. You can, in a single stage to orbit, in a space plane, access low Earth orbit, return to the top of the tower, and refuel and reuse that spacecraft again for space flight. Even more interesting, particularly if you live in Australia, um, is that if you built one in Australia and one in New York, it would take you one hour to ascend the elevator, four hours to fly to New York, one hour to come down the other side. You're on the other side of the world in six hours. <laughs> Great, I'm glad you like that. Um, <laughs> So uh, we, uh, we first presented this work in, in a paper we wrote in uh, Acta Astronautica um, in uh, 2009. Um, so there ha this concept has been around for a while. The most, you're probably more familiar uh, with the idea of a space elevator as a tether. Um, uh, so um, uh, Konstantin uh, Tolskovsky uh, came up with this idea in 1895 of attaching a counterweight um, uh, to, and it would go beyond low Earth orbit uh, in the modern versions of this, the cable's around 100,000 kilometers long. It's anchored on the equator, and the spin of the Earth will keep the, ca the cable uh, taut. Uh, so it sounds good. Um, I'm going to highlight a few issues with this concept. Um, so, number one. So setting aside whether you could make this cable strong enough, um, it's fairly clear that um, carbon nanotubes aren't going to do it uh, because of the defect rate in them. And they're not going to be quite strong enough to achieve this on the Earth. Perfect for the moon, but not on Earth. Um, the other problems are, uh, in low Earth orbit, we have a lot of micrometeorites. Uh, so most of these are artificial. Uh, sorry, most of these are natural, but some of them are artificial. Um, if I get hit by a fleck of paint um, it, on my spacecraft, it breaks the window. Um, they're traveling maybe eight kilometers uh, per second towards you. Um, it's just a huge hit. Um, and so we are estimating that a meteorite will sever a space tether uh, in about um, less, than heart, less than six months. Around five months, it will sever each cable. Uh, so building a space tether is a race against time. I build one, and then I constantly, my, rover, my climbers have to race up to build up other ones before the first ones fail. Um, Low Earth orbit um, has larger objects, natural and artificial satellites, 10 centimeters of or, or more. Um, getting hit by one of those um, is going to be like being hit by a bunker buster bomb. Um, so there's no way anybody's going to be able to survive that in the LEO environment. Uh, lower down where we're building in 20 kilometers, the atmosphere is going to take care of this uh, for us, mostly because they will burn up as they enter. But higher, around 100 kilometers, this is a serious problem. And so you're going to have to maneuver your space tether to avoid them. Also, in space, oxygen uh, dissociates, and atomic oxygen will damage the surfaces of your uh, space tether um, around uh, one um, uh, micron per month. So um, these tethers are usually pretty thin, uh, maybe 50 microns. So one micron a month doesn't sound a lot, but you're going to rapidly reduce the structural integrity uh, of it. And then like, lastly, and probably the hardest to deal with, is uh, lightning. 
Um, so these tethers are typically maybe five centimeters in diameter. If they're hit by lightning, it's going to sever it. It's going to re release enough power to sever a, uh, a tether. Um, and the best place for lightning is in Alaska. There's about one lightning strike every 13 years. Um, but that's before you built the largest lightning uh, conductor on Earth and placed <laughs> it at that location. Um, so this is going to be a really difficult challenge to, uh, to beat off for a space tether. And probably the chances of total catastrophic failure are unacceptably high because of lightning. Um, so by contrast, if we only built to 20 kilometers, we can build this macroscopic building that can have lightning conductors down the side, and we're sheltered by the atmosphere, uh, which is going to burn up the majority of the micrometeorites before they strike the structure. And then even if they do strike the structure, our plan is to have many, many um, um, uh, uh, segments, many cells, which are all uh, joined together so that you can lose a certain percentage of the structural integrity uh, from those cells without uh, losing the uh, building's integrity. Um, and then we would be able to, even better, go and repair them using conventional techniques uh, uh, to fill the holes, maybe releasing gases uh, with plasticizers uh, that would uh, uh, fill in the gaps that have been uh, formed. Um, so uh, um, it's not just me working on this concept. I had a large uh, graduate team on it. Um, I'm showing uh, uh, Dr. Raj Seth, who uh, received his uh, PhD from York University. Um, he's now head of an engineering school and in uh, India. Um, and he did a, a great deal of uh, work on the initial uh, uh, prototypes and, uh, and uh, uh, concept. Um, so now we're um, expanding this. It turns out that in our preliminary research, um, wrinkling turns out to be a major problem. Okay, so uh, wrinkling uh, happens when you bend uh, an inflatable structure a little bit too much, uh, and it causes a dramatic change uh, in the structural integrity. Uh, a little bit more about that later. Um, we're also working on some more patents. Um, uh, so this is a, a, a neat one. Um, uh, this is a first. Um, we've just got this animation uh, completed this week. Um, this is showing a means by which two elevators traveling on the same core can pass each other by using a spiral grip that rotates as they approach each other. And this enables bidirectional travel. So that means that we can have elevators going up and elevators coming down at the same time. So, also, we discovered that the, the current uh, mathematical theory doesn't work very well, particularly at this onset of wrinkling. Um, and uh, so uh, the red zone is where we have to avoid. Uh, as the wrinkles start to, to go, uh, the line goes very nonlinear. But we compared some theories against each other to determine that really the conventional theory didn't work very well, uh, and that uh, actually one of the other theories uh, was much better at predicting the performance. The idea is to establish hard engineering guidelines as to how you build inflatable structures. Um, so we didn't realize it initially, but we came to realize later that one of the big advantages of a space tower is in wind generation. So on the ground, if I have a turbine, it's only 20% efficient because the wind only blows strong enough to turn it 20% of the time. Um, industry uses power 24-7. So if it's not sunny and it's not windy, we have a problem. And the problem is only solved by large-scale nuclear power stations and hydroelectric uh, uh, solutions currently. Um, uh, and so uh, uh, we realized that if you lofted the turbines to the stratosphere between 12 and 14 kilometers, the wind blows 98% of the time strong enough to turn your turbine. So you increase the efficiency of your turbines by a factor of four. A single tower could provide around five gigawatts of energy, approximately 20% of Ontario's total peak demand. Uh, and it would do so inobtrusively. The turbines are not near the ground. They're not going to kill birds, uh, and you're not going to hear them. So um, we think that the top of the tower could also be used for communications. Um, in uh, Toronto, um, all of our TV antennas are pointed at the CN Tower. The CN Tower is distributing uh, TV networks 24-7. Uh, uh, there is a whole payload bay um, for this kind of uh, equipment. Currently, if you're not near a tower, um, you have to use a geostationary satellite. They cost around a billion dollars. They launched, uh, they operate for 15 years, uh, and then they typically fail. So on average, you're using 10-year-old technology if you're receiving stuff uh, from space. Uh, uh, and it cannot be serviced. We cannot get to those orbits. Uh, we cannot fix the equipment. Um, 
By contrast, if you have the payload, your comm space, at the top of a 20-kilometer tw tower, you can cover an area 1,000 kilometers in any direction. You can send your service technicians to fix the problems with the stuff. You can upgrade every year to the latest digital technology and the di latest digital distribution. Um, uh, so uh, we've teamed up uh, with a UK uh, rock band um, called uh, Space Elevator. Uh, and um, this is the Duchess and uh, David Young. Um, and um, they actually uh, wrote a song about space elevators. I'm going to show you, a, just to end, I'm just going to show you a clip um, uh, of that to give you a sense of uh, how we envisage uh, this tower. Well, that's a tremendous amount of material to try and get across in 17 minutes, uh, Brendan. So thank you for, for the effort. Um, I want to ask you, is this a purely academic exercise, or is this a proposal for a practical project? And who do you direct the proposal to? Um, so I believe that the way to com commoditize these kinds of technologies is through patents. Um, and so um, um, the advantage of the patent is that if you want to spend a billion dollars building the space tower and you own the patent, now other people can't just come and copy you after you've made the initial investment. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we think that this is the key. This is why we're pursuing the uh, patent so uh, veriferously. Um, and so um, we would like to build one in Canada first. Uh, we have actually haven't solved the US, the, the Canadian patent yet. It's still pending since 2008. Um, and so yes, patents move in different speeds. Um, and, and so uh, we're looking for partners who might want to build a prototype. Um, we think that um, if we went to, say, 1.5 kilometers, uh, then this would be uh, the tallest uh, uh, structure in the world. If you were building a new capital city, uh, they're doing it in Saudi Arabia, they're doing it in Egypt, uh, then this could really put your center on the map. Uh, and so, yes, we're talking to a variety of, uh, of architects, um, uh, construction companies, uh, about where we might uh, house the first project. Um, for well, forever in the initial efforts to, uh, to control space, to commandeer space, and to conquer space, the efforts were typically made by governments. Yes. And then latterly, only in the last few years, a private sector effort has emerged primarily in the United States. Have you got yeah, any I, of those sorry. entrepreneurial thoughts for yourself? Okay, so um, when SpaceX is mentioned, everybody mentions it's a private space yeah, company. And we're going to hear from Moonex. Yep. Yeah, and, and Moonex. So there's definitely, uh, and now it's beginning to be um, uh, state uh, sponsored. Um, I guess the difference here, so all, all of the space technology that you're used to, it wasn't built by NASA or the Canadian Space Agency. It was built by companies like McDonald, Etweiler, and Boeing. Um, and so, um, uh, but what we're moving from is a system where the government directs uh, the development of technology, which historically it's not great at. Um, to a point where the entrepreneurs are directing the development of the technologies, and I think that's where the transformation occurs. Um, okay, I know there's some VC people out there, so give us a number. Great. What's the number? Uh, for the total tower, the full one? Yeah. $5 billion to 24 hours. A bargain. A bargain. <laughs> Thank you so much, Thank Dr. Gwen. Donald Trump. Hey.